Back in 2019, the UK government hired this man, Henry Dimbleby, to lead the first major review into the UK's food system in the past 75 years. We have a food yes. system that currently uh, makes us sick. The poorest neighbourhoods die seven years earlier on average. People who live in them than the richest. A large part of that is down to food. It's destroying the environment. It's not sustainable. In the end, our food system will change because by definition it can't survive as it is. So he did just that and came out with a recommendation, which is that in the UK, we need to reduce our animal product consumption by 30% in the next 10 years to meet our climate targets. And this recommendation was also echoed by the UK's chief scientific advisor as well. Which is great news, right? The UK government hires someone to do a food system evaluation. That person does the food system evaluation, comes back to the government with a recommendation, and the government follows the recommendation. Because why wouldn't they? Isn't that the entire reason why they hired this man in the first place? Except, of course, this is the UK government and meat-eating we're talking about, so logic doesn't tend to go hand in hand. This is what Rishi Sunak had to say about this recommendation back in October, when he was also the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Oh, and for a bit of context, we're currently having a leadership contest here in the UK to decide who the next Prime Minister is going to be, and Rishi Sunak is one of the two people who is in this contest. And just take a look at where he chose to have this interview take place. Is that best place for you to be this morning. Well, well actually, that we're on, on, on that point, Give, it, no, no, we'll come, no, if I could ask the question, because we're almost out of time, you are at a meat market today. Why are you in a meat market when we're told to eat less meat to try and cut down on carbon emissions? No, I, I'm, I, I mean, I, I'm not telling anyone uh, to eat less meat. You're not telling people to eat less meat, but your chief scientific advisor is to try and cut down on carbon emissions. Oh, well, there's lots of different ways that we can tackle climate change. And last week, the Prime Minister outlined the net zero strategy. I don't think there was anything uh, about that in there. But your government hired him. You paid him to do this. So I don't understand what you were expecting. What did you think you were going to gain from paying someone to do a food system evaluation? Of course, he was going to come back and recommend that we reduce the number of animal products that we consume, because that's exactly what the science is saying. And then when he does just that, you then turn around and say, oh, no, we're not going to do what the person we paid to tell us what to do is telling us what to do. Oh, and that recommendation is also backed up by the chief scientific advisor. Why would we listen to him? But Rishi Sunak went even further because this is what he said at the end of July this year in The Telegraph. In a pitch to farmers and conservative members in rural areas, Mr. Sunak will on Saturday set out the most significant reforms to farming in half a century, with new targets for domestically produced food and regulations to prevent high quality farmland from being given over to rewilding and solar farms. He said, my constituency is home to hundreds of beef and lamb farmers, and I'm committed to supporting the fantastic industry they represent. I will put a renewed focus on it and ensure that we are supporting our farmers to boost production. Oh, and this just gets even better now, doesn't it? Because basically what we have now is a situation where the government has paid someone to do a food system evaluation. That person has done the evaluation, come back and told us that we need to reduce our animal product consumption. And then one of our next potential prime ministers turns around and says, not only am I going to ignore this recommendation, but I'm going to do the exact opposite. I'm going to put a renewed focus on boosting production instead. And why? Why is he ignoring the recommendations of these people? Well, as he says in his own words, he has hundreds of beef and lamb farmers in his constituency, so he doesn't want to jeopardize his seat in that constituency. Literally ignoring science and compromising our environment and our future because he's worried that a few hundred farmers won't vote for him. This is absolutely the mentality of a self-indulgent narcissist whose priority is short-term gain no matter the long-term consequences. Do you think people are stupid? No, I think people will see that... You think yes. people aren't going to see through this? Okay, but what about the other potential Prime Minister, Liz Truss? Liz Truss has refused to recognise the importance of animal welfare in post-Brexit trade deals, the Environment Secretary has said. It is fair to say that there were some challenges I had in getting Liz Truss to recognise the importance of animal welfare in particular, and that we should reflect it in trade agreements. And it just gets even better, doesn't it? Because 
We're out here trying to get people to recognize that animals are sentient individuals who deserve rights and autonomy, and our other potential prime minister is someone who has refused to even acknowledge that animal welfare is important. And just brace yourselves for this utterly bizarre clip of her from when she was the head of the Department of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. When it comes to British food and drink, we have never had it so good. We import two thirds of our cheese. That is a disgrace. In a fortnight, I'm going to Paris for the world's largest food trade fair and I will be bigging up British products. In December, I'll be in Beijing, opening up new pork markets. During that time, she also boasted that she had removed 34,000 farm inspections a year and had removed 80% of what she calls bureaucratic red tape, but we might call environmental regulations. She said a future conservative government will continue to bear down on red tape. We are considering pilots for landowners and farmers to manage watercourses themselves to get rid of a lot of bureaucracy. These cuts meant that farmers could dump waste like pesticides and animal feces into the UK's rivers and waterways, which, spoiler alert, is exactly what they did. In fact, an investigation looking at the River Axe found that 95% of farms had not complied with slurry storage regulations and 49% were polluting the river. And as a result of her cuts, animal farmers are now the number one polluters of UK rivers. Yes, that's right. The same farmers who we are told are stewards of the land and who we should trust to protect our environment are also the number one polluters of our rivers. Hmm, funny that. I'm determined to press ahead, restoring habitats, cleaning rivers, and improving our atmosphere so that future generations can enjoy clean air and enjoy the countryside. So basically, either way, what happens next is not going to be good for the environment and is definitely not going to be good for the animals. So what are we going to do about it? Well, we can't rely on our governments to solve these issues because they're just not going to. In fact, they're going to do the opposite. They're going to make matters worse. And actually, Henry Dumbleby himself highlighted the perceived political problem around this issue. He told The Guardian that although asking the public to eat less meat, supported by a mix of incentives and penalties, would be politically toxic, it was the only way to meet the country's climate and biodiversity targets. And he's right, political impotence is not going to solve these issues, and yet that's all we are getting from our elected officials. This populist rhetoric that seeks to tell people what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. I mean, Rishi Sanak was in a meat market for that interview, belittling something that every single credible environmental organization in the world and his own government's chief scientific advisors are telling us that we need to address and change. This is nothing short of an absolute scandal. That is a disgrace. And if we just look at the reduction targets, it's for 30%. Greenpeace says that we need to reduce our animal product consumption by 70% to meet our climate targets. And that 30% figure we have to take with a grain of salt because Henry Dimbleby himself said that there's no point recommending impossible things. And he even consulted with the president of the National Farmers Union in the process. They said the NFU has done some early work with Henry Dimbleby on what a food strategy can look like. And I am delighted that he has included much of this in his framework. We are looking forward to working with his review to deliver a food system that is fair for all, except of course for the animals. So basically this 30% reduction 
is not based on what would be the most optimal or desirable, but instead is based on what is perceived to be the most palatable. And even that, the most palatable recommendation they could come up with is not going to be implemented and is actually being opposed. So when people say, yes, but shouldn't the governments be the ones to implement these changes and incentivize these changes? The answer is yes, of course the government should, but they're not going to. Simply put, they're going to do nothing, unless of course we make it politically acceptable. And the only way that that will happen is if we make the changes ourselves. And beyond all of this, what these stats and this conversation ignores is that from an ethical perspective, 30% is nowhere near enough. 70% is nowhere near enough because for the animals, anything short of 100% is still contributing to their unnecessary suffering and exploitation. So the environmental argument shows why we selfishly need to act, but the ethical argument shows why we selflessly need to act. And that brings us to the end of this video. So as always, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And as always, let me know down below in the comments what you thought of the issues that I discussed in today's video and whether or not you think that these two potential prime ministers will be good or bad for the future of the UK. I know what I think. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And I'll see you all in the next video.